through the hangout. If you're watching this, folks, apologize for the delay. We just had it working and had to turn it on live, and suddenly it's not. So, be right with you. Where's he from? Adi is from California, or at least that's where he's living now. Hey, there he is. There I am. <laughs> awesome. Great. Cool. Well, are you all set? We'll go ahead and get started. We're on air right now. Great. Cool. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm all set. All right, cool. I'll give you a little intro here, let everybody know who you are. This is uh, Adi Kamdar. He's going to be our first virtual lecture series speaker uh, of the semester. We have two more coming after this. Um, Adi works for the EFF, the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Um, he, uh, an activist, he specializes in patents, free speech, intermediary liability, and copyright issues. He also coordinates student activism and open access advocacy. He studied history of science at Yale University, where he was chapter president and a member of the board of directors of Students of the Free Culture. For students for Free Culture, excuse me. Previously, he interned at EFF at the Berkman Center for Internet and Society and with the Open Video Alliance. In his free time, he enjoys music, improv, things that are delicious, and being outdoors. You can follow Adi on his personal Twitter account, at Adi Kamdar. Uh, tonight, Adi is going to be talking about the importance of our privacy in regards to companies, corporations, and the government. Afterwards, we'll be opening up for questions from the live audience. If I see anything coming through uh, Twitter or uh, YouTube, I'll try to answer, but I can't guarantee it. I'm not really ready for that yet. We're just going to see what happens here. Hopefully, our live audience is nice and chatty. Please be nice and chatty. <laughs> Thanks again, Adi, for doing this for us, and I'll turn it over to you. Great. Great. Is there, is there any chance we could turn off the, uh, the mic? There's a little bit of echo. Yeah, I'll do that. Yeah. Great. Um, well, thank you for the intro. Um, I'm happy to be here. It's, uh, I've considered taking out that part in my bio that says I like delicious things because, like, everybody likes delicious things. Um, but yeah, today I'm going to talk to you guys about privacy. Um, and I apologize in advance because this is going to be half an hour of just me chatting. So I kind of want to make it a little more interactive. Um, if you guys have any questions or have any anything, really, um, feel free to raise your hand, ask away. Um, so. Uh, like Adam mentioned, I work for the Electronic Frontier Foundation, or EFF, um, and we were founded in, um, in 1990. Um, we're based in San Francisco, which is where I am right now, and we're a civil liberties organization dedicated to protecting digital rights, um, whether that means your ability to freely speak online, or your privacy online, or things like your ability to innovate or create um, without being encumbered by like a really harsh patent system or copyright system. Basically, any sort of intersection between law and technology we deal with. Uh, but today I want to talk to you guys about privacy because privacy is kind of on everybody's minds right now. Um, you may have heard of us before about EFF, um, especially recently because, um, to put it lightly, uh, it's been a very busy summer. Um, Thanks to recent leaks, uh, we now have even more evidence um, that the National Security Agency is conducting widespread, untargeted domestic surveillance on, on millions of innocent Americans. 
Um, and I say even more for a particular reason. Um, I say this because this is something that we've been saying for the last six or seven years. Um, in 2005, the New York Times came out with an article that reported on some of the NSA's spying activities um, that were purely domestic. And in early 2006, a technician at AT&T named Mark Klein walked into our office um, to provide documents detailing uh, the construction of a secret room, uh, a secret room in AT&T headquarters in, um, in San Francisco that basically was a splitter. Um, all the information was split, and it went either to AT&T, well, it went both to AT&T and to the NSA, um, which had a bunch of surveillance technology in there that was capable of reading domestic and international communications. So this was a big deal, and um, a few weeks later, we filed our first lawsuit. Um, this was against AT&T, and a few years after that, we filed another lawsuit against the NSA itself. Um, the AT&T lawsuit fell through because the government decided to give them immunity, but our NSA lawsuit is uh, still going strong, and since the, you know, the last few months, we've launched a number of other lawsuits, including one other big lawsuit against the NSA, um, which is gloriously titled uh, the Unitarian Universalist Church versus NSA because it's, it's them and a bunch of gun rights groups and a bunch of environmental groups and a bunch of left groups and right groups that have come together and said, hey, we don't want you guys spying on us. We think it's unconstitutional. Um, we've also launched a number of Freedom of Information Act requests. Um, so these are particular lawsuits that try to get the government to turn over certain information. Because what's going on is um, we have what we know because of leaks, but otherwise we don't know what's going on. We don't know how the government is interpreting the law um, because it's secret. It's all secret. We've had a few major victories in, uh, in this regard, in the FOIA regard. The latest one happened today, actually, just a few hours ago. Um, in fact, uh, there's a group of lawyers and technologists and activists sitting in the room right over there that are poring over hundreds of documents that the government released today that try and interpret what this law means and um, that are you know secret court cases that have come out. Um, but before I get into the weeds, I want to I take a step back and address what the problems actually are. Uh, the biggest issue when it comes to all this NSA stuff, which has been in the news for, for a little while now, um, is that such wide-scale, untargeted domestic surveillance is illegal and unconstitutional. This is our view. This is something that we strongly believe. And it's, unconstitu it's unconstitutional because it violates the Fourth Amendment, which protects us against widespread warrantless wiretapping, um, warrantless searches, and dragnet surveillance. And it violates the First Amendment, um, which is all about freedom of speech. And this is something that a lot of people don't necessarily um, think about when it comes to privacy, uh, is how are we protected by the First Amendment? Um, part of the First Amendment includes the freedom to associate, the freedom of association, which means you're allowed to associate yourself with whatever religious group or political group or minority group or whatever. And um, the government can't really coerce that group into doing anything or compel uh, that group into turning over certain information. So the courts have held and the Supreme Court has held that this is a fundamental protection of the First Amendment and that even you know compelled disclosure of membership lists. For example, in the 60s, the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored Persons, was required um, by the FBI to turn over lists of who their membership is and they took this to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said, you can't do that, FBI. Um, you, can't turn, you can't force these guys to turn over the list because this violates a fundamental freedom, which is the freedom to associate with a particular group. And if all of a sudden your ability to associate with groups was violated or was out in the open or was collected by the government, there's a sort of chilling effect. Um, you know, people will stop associating with fringe groups or with minority groups. Um, so this is a violation of privacy that is protected by the First Amendment. Uh, another major issue um, is that the laws, like I mentioned earlier, around this whole NSA ordeal, um, namely Section 215 of the Patriot Act and Section 702 of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, which is what 
Prism is based off of. You may have heard of Prism over the summer. Um, these are interpreted completely behind closed doors. They're basically secret law. Um, we don't know how the government interprets these laws, how they're carried out, how the courts have interpreted these laws, whether they found instances of this unconstitutional or not, and what level of oversight there is regarding them. You know, this is a system that operates in a black box that the public has no say over, and that Congress, even the people who, you know, maybe have some sort of oversight, maybe have some sort of uh, access to what's going on, even they've admitted that they have no idea of what's going on. So this is something we're trying to fight against. Um, we've learned a lot over the last few months. Uh, we've learned that the government collects information about the phone calls of practically every American, um, and that there are programs in place to collect emails and videos and other content from major companies like Google and Microsoft and Yahoo. Uh, we learned that the government claims oversight over these issues, but that the secret court that allegedly has oversight has already come out to claim that they don't have adequate power. And if I'm not being depressing enough, we learned that last week the NSA has the ability to bypass most, most forms of encryption. Uh, this is the fundamental security feature of the internet and of digital communications. It's how people communicate securely. And the NSA, <laughs> you know, based on recent documents, basically has access to, to all of that. Which is crazy, which is a lot. Um, now, I can go on forever about this stuff since there's so, so much. Um, and like I said, more and more stuff is coming out every day. Today alone, hundreds of documents are being revealed that all those people are pouring over. Um, but I want to address a bigger point, uh, which is, you know, the, the fact that I'm guessing there are a few of you in, the, in this room, and maybe they're not, um, that are thinking, Okay, all this stuff is happening, but so what? Who cares? Um, you know, if none of you in this room are thinking that, then great, we've made progress. But um, I want to talk about this point because it's a it's something that a number of people um, bring up all the time. Uh, it, it's what a professor of mine um, used to call the Joy Behar theory of privacy. How many of you guys know who Joy Behar is? One hand, awesome, great. <laughs> um, so uh, Joy Behar is a, is a talk show host. She's on The View. She's also a comedian. Um, but there's a great uh, Saturday Night Live sketch parodying her where, you know, she goes around saying, so what? Who cares? This is like her catchphrase. Like, who cares? Um, and this was his view of how some people approach privacy. Yeah, all these people are collecting information, but I'm not doing anything wrong. A lot of people have this view, right? Why should I care about this? I'm doing nothing wrong. I've got nothing to hide. I'm, I'm here to say that this argument, the nothing to hide argument, needs to stop. And it needs to stop now. And here's why. Privacy is a beast. Um, Professor uh, Daniel Solovey, who's written quite a bit about privacy and uh, who wrote an excellent book called Nothing to Hide, um, uh, which is about the nothing to hide argument, he, he put it best when he said, privacy, however, is too complex a concept to be reduced to a single essence. It is a plurality of different things that do not share any one element, but nevertheless bear a resemblance to one another. Um, or as you know, the same professor who came up with the Joy Behar theory uh, describes it, it's like the fable of uh, the blind men who are feeling an elephant. You know, a couple blind men come across an elephant and they don't know what it is, and one touches the elephant's leg and says, hey, this is a tree trunk. And one touches the, you know, the trunk of the elephant and says, hey, this is a snake. And one touches the rope, or, or the, the tail of the elephant, I ruined that. <laughs> one touches the tail of the elephant and says, hey, this is a rope. Uh, and it turns out they were all touching the same thing. They were all touching the elephant, um, but they had different ways of interacting with and interpreting what this thing was. And that's kind of how... Um, we feel about privacy. You know, when it comes to the elephant of privacy, people have different views and different feelings. Some people may think that privacy can be violated if your secrets are invaded, if things that you think are secret are, um, you know, are encroached upon. Others may think privacy can be violated if someone, you know, like a peeping Tom, for example, is watching you. Uh, you know, they're looking at things that aren't necessarily secret, um, you know, that 
we all have. <laughs> uh, but uh, in this instance, um, you may you know you may have nothing secret to hide, but you still feel creeped out. And this is something that we could consider an invasion of privacy. Um, other things uh, are, are other things that um, you may consider a violation of privacy is any sort of compilation of data about you, um, whether that's you know from the government or from a corporation, even if it's public information. Uh, now, there's nothing inherently wrong with being able to look at information that is either public or that people have chosen to share, but the mere act of compiling all this separate information into one dossier um, could overstep bounds and could feel a little creepy. So there's a difference between putting information out there for anybody to find and putting information out there to be searched and sorted. Um, if you walk down a crowded public street, for example, you're probably going to be seen by dozens of people. Um, but it would still feel creepy for anyone, any single person, to be able to look up a list of every single road you've walked down or every single store you've went to. Uh, this is why Google Street View, for example, part of Google Maps, disguises the identity of people photographed on public streets, even though the information was not really private or secret. Another uh, notorious example of, of the compilation of data is when a, a group of Fordham Law students put together a dossier of publicly available information about Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia. Um, this is a, you know, a famous case where they poured through uh, online databases and public information and created this you know, 20-page paper or however many page paper about who he is, where he lives, what his phone number is, what his wife's information is, what you know, things he likes, the clubs he's a part of, so on and so forth. This was all public information. And yet, when you put it in one dossier, when you put it in one place, people get freaked out, uh, including Justice Scalia. Um, so though these individual pieces may be publicly available, when they're brought together in a, in a single search or compilation, that's when the privacy goosebumps come out. So why is that? Uh, it's because more information can come out when this data is compiled. All of a sudden, by following your location or by viewing your phone metadata, this is a word that's being thrown around quite a bit, which is essentially who you call, when you call, and for how long you call, we can figure out what you're interested in, your religious group you're part of. For example, if you stop at a mosque or church, if you're cheating on your spouse, if you have a disease because you called, you know, the HIV testing service, or you know, in an extreme case, if you if you called a gynecologist, spoke for half an hour, and then called the local Planned Parenthood, these are serious examples, but they go to show you how aggregated information about you, even if it's individually innocuous, can paint a very vivid picture about who you are. And we don't know how this data is going to be used. Is the government going to use this information to enforce the law? To broadly interpret the law? Are you going to lose out on health benefits, for example, or job opportunities? Is information collected for one purpose, national security, for example, going to be used to press drug charges or to curb tax fraud? And is the information collected about you are these dossiers about who you are and who you contact, is that the real you? Is that the full picture, or is this a distorted picture of who you are? So going back to this fundamental legal questions around privacy, the issue is much bigger than just you and me. Um, and so is the Constitution. So the Bill of Rights wasn't written with a majority in mind. Uh, if you carry the popular opinion, for example, you don't need to be protected. If I, I don't know, if I, if I wrote a blog post or gave a speech about, what's something people have been talking about? If I, if I gave a blog post about, uh, about how Miley Cyrus's performance at the VMAs, for example, was like super problematic and it's such an issue and this is like really disgusting, I don't need the Constitution to protect me. Everybody agrees with me. But if I take a contrary approach or a minority approach and I say, uh, you know, not only was the performance great, but it was an inspiration and it was a great commentary on whatever, 
then I need to watch my back. And this is where the First Amendment comes in. This is where the First Amendment protects me from the government uh, powers that be from cracking down on unwanted speech or association or religion or press. And it's the same thing with the Fourth Amendment, which says, and I'm going to quote this, the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated, and no warrants shall issue but upon probable cause supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly describing the place to be searched, and the persons or things to be seized. So this is very particular language, where it says you as a person have some sort of security in your effects, in your papers. Um, and these have been interpreted to mean not just your you know, physical papers, but your digital documents, your emails, your Skype chats. And these items aren't secured by the Constitution for individual concerns. Um, this amendment is focused on the societal benefits of a world in which the government has to first make you know, a significant showing before it gets access to anyone's papers and correspondence, uh, and the general chilling effect that is created when the government can read anyone's papers at any time. If you think back to, to U.S. history class, one of the main catalysts of the Fourth Amendment one of the main reasons why we have the Fourth Amendment is to protect against general warrants. These things that the British, you know, uh, instituted that said, hey, the government doesn't have to specify ahead of time whose papers they're going to search and review. They could just get anybody's papers. They could just issue a decree and get anybody's uh, information. And the Fourth Amendment protected civil rights groups and fringe political groups from law enforcement encroachment on their rights. The Constitution, in other words, um, has checks to majority power. And it, this is for a specific reason. Uh, and the reason is that this is the only way a functioning democracy can work. You need to protect people who hold minority opinions in order to have the discussions necessary for a functional, or ideally functional, political system. Privacy exists for many, many reasons, and we need to reclaim the idea that the government can't freely encroach upon our, our papers and effects, uh, which in this day and age could mean you know, the emails you send or your Facebook messages, which is great, good. So now that we're on the same page about that, um, we're free from government invasion of privacy. But that brings up a, another interesting question around privacy, which is, yes, we have the Bill of Rights to protect us from the government, but heck, we go online uh, and, you know, freely and often willingly give corporations lots of data. Uh, who here has a Facebook profile? All right, that's, that's pretty much everybody. I think that's everybody. Maybe that's not everybody. I have a Facebook profile. Um, uh, and, you know, who uses Google products? Who has a Gmail account? Yeah, so pretty much everybody. Um, so, uh, you know, who signs up for, for every hot new startup or downloads new apps and willingly gives out information about how you're feeling or your health or if you have like a Fitbit, you know, how much you've run that day, for example, which I, I will willingly admit I do not have, but I will tell you that I have run zero miles in the past few days. Um, this is sort of information that we willingly give out and yet we're so loath to give this sort of information to the government. Why do we trust corporations with this sort of information? And I think one simple reason is that, um, well, I mean, I think the first reason is that the government can put you in jail. And uh, corporations can't, at least not yet. Um, uh, that's, that's a pretty good reason to, to prevent the government from encroaching upon our privacy and encroaching upon our, our freedom of speech. Um, but the other reason is that I, I don't really believe that we do trust corporations as much as people make it out. Um, you know, we don't necessarily trust corporations with holding and abusing our data. Right now they're using our information for marketing purposes mainly to make sure that you get ads that are tailored to you because you like bananas and you like the Mets and you like jumping up and down, so you should get that ad for the... 
I don't know, the jumping baseball playing banana. And uh, that might make some sense, right? I don't know. But um, as soon as companies start using that information to kidnap children, you bet we're going to be up in arms about that, right? This is something that we don't want companies to do. But even for marketing purposes, some of us don't want companies to send tailored ad towards us. Me, for example. I don't really want companies to collect a lot of information about me um, so that I can get specific ads for me because that means I know somewhere they have this analysis that I am this person who likes X, Y, and Z, so send this information about X, Y, and Z to me. I don't know how that information is going to be used down the line. There are these companies, for example, called data brokers that um, interact with all the social networks you use, that interact with all the websites you visit, and collect information about you. One, for example, called Axiom, has profiles on 700 million people around the world and you know 1,500 points of data on each of these people. So they know everything about you. <laughs> um, and yet, you have really no control over how this information is used. But you kind of want this sort of control. You kind of want to be able to opt out. Privacy, after all, uh, and this is something I want everyone to, to take away from this talk, is uh, that privacy is about control. We want to be able to control how our information is spread and used. Um, you know, if we willingly gave Facebook our photo and our personal information, we want knowledge that deleting this data means Facebook deletes it too. Um, or that no one else has access to it. That Facebook doesn't necessarily use it for marketing purposes. We want control over this information. They claim that, you know, um, our generation, I'm going to say our generation because I only graduated from college a few years ago, so I, I, I'm with you guys. Um, they, they claim that we don't care about privacy, and I don't think that's true. I, I don't want pictures of me, um, you know, doing things to show up on my mom's Facebook feed, for example. So I, I pick those specific privacy settings. I don't want pictures of me used for marketing purposes, so I opt out of those particular services. Um, and you know, th th this is why privacy is about control. We want a, the ability to have sort of control over what happens to our data online. And if the government is collecting this information too, we want control over that. We want to know exactly what they're collecting and how they're collecting it, so we can make sure it's done in a way that doesn't violate the Constitution. You know, we live in a day where all of us, we live in an age where all of us, um, you know, especially you guys, especially people in college, um, are leaving permanent digital footprints everywhere. And, um, you know, college, many people will tell you, and even more will try to prevent you from knowing, <laughs> um, is a time to make mistakes. It's a time for you to figure out what your life is, uh, figure out what your passions are, figure out uh, what your political views and your sexual orientation and your religious views and all these sorts of like important things about you, figure out what they are and to try things out, to make mistakes. Um, but we live with everything being recorded and put online all the time. And you know, don't get me started on Google Glass and these new things that are coming out, these new technologies that are coming out. But we really need to keep in mind that um, this is why privacy is important. Privacy is important because we live in an era where all this information about us is being put online. All this information about us is being collected. And if we want to make sure that you know, the future carries out or plays out the way we want it to, that companies don't have particular information about us, that our you know, future job hiring and um, uh, employment status and our future uh, uh, status around like health insurance and stuff isn't really uh, broached by this information or that um, you know the government isn't cracking down, law enforcement isn't cracking down on us because of things we did in the past. We need to make sure we have control over our future and that's why control is so important. So I think um, I guess to, to kind of wrap this up, um, at least for now, I kind of want this to be more of a dialogue because I, I want to I address particular questions that you guys have. Um, I think we need to do away with this argument that I have nothing to hide, so why is this thing important? 
um, because it's really not about that. Um, you know, some people claim that you do have stuff to hide, that you wouldn't willingly give out your passwords, and that you have curtains on your windows, and that so on and so forth. But those are those are extreme cases. I think we need to approach the future and approach how privacy works um, in a way that uh, realizes that we may not have anything to hide now, or we may not have um, this approach to privacy now that says, okay, we're a bad person, or that all this information is being used for positive purposes, so it's okay if, if people take it. Because we don't know how it's going to be used in the future. And we already have instances, you know, this is very much like, I don't know if you guys have read the short story or the story, the book, it's not really a short story, by Franz Kafka. It's called The Trial. It's about a guy who's being um, uh, prosecuted, but he's not told why. He's not told exactly what the charges against him are and what information they have about him. And he just has to kind of wander around and figure out what exactly is going on. Um, and yet they hold this from him. And this is kind of uh, you know, what we're operating in with these increasingly secret courts and these increasingly secret laws. We're, in, we're operating in a world where we don't know how this information is going to be used in the future. Or if this information is being collected for one reason, how it's going to be used for the second reason. So we need to take control over our privacy. Now, this can all sound like doom and gloom, uh, and to some extent it is. To some extent, the revelations over the last few months have been shocking because it's been kind of surprising the extent to which the government and these entities um, have information about us. But I think we as consumers and we as citizens can push back. On the government level, you can push back by calling your congressman, by telling them that you want accountability, that you want transparency over these processes. And there's a number of political groups, including ours, uh, that make this easy, that make it easy to contact your congressman. Um, but from a more consumeristic perspective, um, what you can do is band together. You as consumers actually have a fair bit of power. Now granted, you as individuals, you know, one person isn't going to take down Facebook because that's impossible. But uh, not like we want to take down Facebook anyway. But um, uh, one person isn't going to be able to push against this. But you can take these things into your own hands. You can push for stronger privacy protections on a policy level or on a legislative level. This is something that a lot of people are trying to push, for example. Um, they're trying to make sure that you, if you're going online, can set a setting that says, I don't want to be tracked. That's simple, right? A little flag that says, I don't want to be tracked, and then all of a sudden advertisers and companies can't track you online. Um, you know, there are other people that are trying to pass transparency laws that say, hey, uh, I as a consumer should have the ability to ask companies, what information do you have about me and who are you giving this to? And companies should be able to respond. Um, you know, we as consumers should have the right to, to take control over this data. This is something that is already pretty true in places like Europe, which has really strict privacy laws, um, but that the U.S. Doesn't, doesn't quite have. And we don't necessarily want to go all the way there, because to some extent this is a, you know, it could be a violation of free speech or a violation of, of companies being able to innovate. But to some extent we need more accountability over how companies use our data. And I think a good first step is hey, tell us what you're doing with our information. I want to know if you're, you know, why you're marketing these things towards me and what steps I can take to say no. Privacy ultimately is about control. Um, okay, I'm, I'm, I think I'm rambling right now a little bit, um, but I do want to hear your guys' questions and what your guys' thoughts are on, on this sort of issue, if you guys have any questions. Anybody have any questions? Just raise your hand, say your name, and ask. Um, real quick, Adi, do you think this compares uh, to a certain extent to like the Red Scare of the 50s? I mean, you know, before that, communism was the hot thing, and then suddenly it was the bad thing, and everybody was in trouble now because at one point in their life they affiliated with the communist organization. Uh, data I think, I think, could possibly be used like that, couldn't it? Yeah, I, yeah, I think I, there's, a there's a certain similarity. Um, uh, it's not it's necessarily not as, as strict. strict. And um, you know, we don't necessarily know House House on American activities here. No. no. Who um, whatever whatever who acts stood for. Um, cracking down on 
you know, rooting out whoever's a communist. Now I guess I guess terrorism as a term has kind of fit into that, but it, it's a little more specific. Um, I think it is similar to some extent, though, and we've seen in the you know after the Red Scare and after the Cold War era um, surveillance that happened after things like Watergate, for example, where people were spying on people for political purposes. We saw Congress take charge and push back. Um, Congress enacted this thing called the Church Committee, which uh, was a group of uh, senators, a group of congressmen who had transparency and had access to all this information and really cracked down on what the government was doing. And they ended up creating the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act and the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. Now, both those things have their own issues, but what it did was it created a certain level of transparency and a check to government power. Um, and I think that sort of thing is important. I think what we need now is something similar, and this is something we've been pushing for, is another church committee. Um, we need another government uh, committee to m say, hey, what the hell is going on? Let us have access to anything and everything, and let us make sure that this is operating within constitutional bounds, because if it isn't, we need to change this. We need to fix this law. Thank you. Anybody else? Um, hi, my name's Carmen, and I work here at the college, and I think a lot of times I, my generation, I'm very thankful I didn't have Facebook, and we didn't have all those things when I was in college, so we didn't have to worry about photos being out there and all that information that we decided to share um, was, you know, pretty just within our small group. I, I worry about this generation, how openly they share their information, they tweet about things that they maybe later on in the professional lives are going to wish that wasn't out there anymore. Um, and then right now, I think there's some companies, I don't know if these students are aware of that, there's companies that take advantage of some of the situations they might get into. Uh, for example, like mugshot.com really annoys me, where you know a student might get picked up for possession of alcohol or something, get a mugshot taken, and then they use that against them when you do a Google search, for example, and then you have to pay thousands of dollars to get that picture removed. Um, I guess my question is, is once that information's out there, what recourse or how do you you know, what would you recommend to start trying to regain back some of your anonymity? Um, I think that's a great question. And, uh, and uh, uh, this is, a, you know, a fundamental uh, uh, tension when it comes to privacy because um, to some extent you should have the ability to put information out there. To some extent certain information should be public. And to some extent, people should be able to report on things or to create new innovations off this uh, public information or to compile it and create new, um, new websites, new services, and so on. At the same time, if you have this public information about you, whether it's your mugshot or your you know, pictures of you drinking underage or, or whatever, this could be used against you um, in the future. So that's where the tension lies, where it's, okay, we should have the freedom to... to to host and to put this information out there, and yet we want to be able to um, say no. We want to be able to uh, limit the amount of information that is put out there. I think the the proper response is um, is twofold. One is from a personal perspective. Um, one thing we need to do is we need to be more aware. We need to be more aware of what information we are putting out there. Um, you know, I'm someone who uses Facebook and Twitter all the time. And um, you kind of have to check yourself, though, where I don't necessarily want to put, um, you know, pictures from the last party I went to up online. Or I don't necessarily need to tweet about every single piece of food I've eaten um, or every single, you know, uh, location I've been to or whatever. I don't need to check in on Foursquare um, on every single place I've been to. Um, and this is a sort of, uh, you know, to, to some extent that uh, could provide some sort of benefit. It's nice to tell people where you are so they can meet you there or they can ask you about it or you could give recommendations. But at the same time, you don't need to tell anybody everything or you don't need to tell everybody everything. Um, so, you know, growing up with a little more uh, sense of, of, of personal control I think is important. But I think from the other perspective, this is why we need to push for things like control um, and, and uh, push for control on a policy perspective. Um, I think we need to um, figure out how best to 
um, be, uh, tell companies, hey, you have my information. Um, I don't necessarily want this information about me up, so can I delete it? Or can I take con reclaim my name, really? Can I reclaim this information about me? While preserving things like the First Amendment. So this information shouldn't, as, you know, if there's a bad article written about me and how I did something, and yet it's a truthful article, um, I shouldn't have the ability to say, hey, you know, New York Times, take down this information about me, um, because that is curbing free speech. So there, there is a balance to be struck, and that's why this is such a tough question. But at the same time, there are steps you can take to prevent this information from ever getting out there in the first place and to kind of change the social norms um, around how this information is used. I, you know, I'm a strong believer that we have a, a sense of privacy that has changed over time and that you know, beforehand privacy meant I want to be left alone. I don't want people to know what I'm doing. And now privacy is more about control. Now it's, hey, I don't mind being you know, public about certain things, but I want to be able to control exactly who sees this, who uses this, how it's you know, used for commercial purposes or not, and the ability to opt out, to take this away. And I think that's where, that's where privacy is turning, and that's where we as consumers can really double down and ensure that companies give us control over what information we are allowed to put up and what information we, uh, um, we you know, have ownership over. Any other questions? Any other questions? I got another one for you, Adi. Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Um, so I was watching the video the other day, and they were uh, trying to demonstrate how that your just the metadata is so dangerous on the things you're tracking, like for example, on cell phone communications. Mm -hmm. uh, and they were demonstrating about how the different cell towers, when you're making the call, say if you're driving down the interstate. Your, your call is going to go between different cell towers as you drive. So they're actually able to track your exact location as you're making this conversation, making this call and having this conversation. Um, I guess other than, you know, I know some things, but what, what else can we do that in the time being can we help protect our privacy from things like that? I mean, you can't really say don't use a cell phone. <laughs> yeah, and then... And then that's actually the, um, the big question, right? It's how do you tell people to protect their privacy without saying, go live in a cave? Um, and um, it's, it's a tough question. And I think this is where um, really pushing for policy is the right way to go about it. Everybody has a cell phone. You know, I have a cell phone. I carry it around with me all the time. Um, this is a tracking device. You know, it's, it is reporting my exact location every few seconds by pinging a cell, a cell tower. And um, the question is not should it track my location, but who has access to that information? And how is that information being used? Once again, coming to control. So um, one thing that we've been pushing for is location privacy. Um, Right now, the law that governs electronic privacy and things around privacy in your communications, it's called the, um, the Electronic Communications Privacy Act. This was written in the 1980s. This was written in 1984 or 86, maybe 82, one of those dates. Um, regardless, it was a long time ago. And this was written before Facebook, before Google, before, uh, you know, Everybody had a cell phone before a lot of these sorts of things. Um, and it was written in, in an era where people downloaded their emails to their computer from servers. And you know, the government interpreted a certain downloading and opening of email as um, you relinquish all rights because you have opened this email. But if you, if you close it and if you mark it as unread, then it's technically. It, it was a very confusing time way back when, when things weren't really held in the cloud, right? Things weren't held in external servers because you just downloaded them to your computer. And that, in that sense, it felt more like personal information. Um, now everything's held in the cloud. Now everything is stored in servers elsewhere. And you have less control over that data because the government doesn't have to ask you for that information. They ask companies. They ask companies for emails, for location data, and so on and so forth. So, um, the question is, how do we control that? 
Um, right now, the government doesn't need a warrant to get all that information. Um, all they need is, um, you know, a strong subpoena um, or, a, or a subpoena. And, and there's a difference between a warrant and a subpoena. Um, one of them, a warrant, requires a judge to sign off on it. A subpoena doesn't. Um, and this is important because you need a warrant to check your mail, um, like your physical mail, and yet email and all these sorts of new sorts of communications, um, uh, they don't require a warrant. So what we're trying to do is reform laws um, like the Electronic Communications Privacy Act to say, hey, if you want my um, email information or if you want my electronic communications information or if you want my location data, you're going to need a warrant. And that provides an additional check because there's nothing wrong, and if you look back at the Fourth Amendment, it says you need a warrant for this information. The government's not going to check this information and take your papers and take your effects um, without a warrant, without a you know, or using a general warrant. They need a specific warrant for this, and right now that's just not how the reality works. So one thing you can do is push for uh, privacy reforms in your states. Um, three states. Uh, Texas, Maine, and I think Montana just passed pretty strong privacy reforms, and there's some conversation happening on the national level about this. So we're seeing a sea change, and we're seeing it start, but um, you know it's not happening fast enough. Any other questions? And I'm willing to talk about whatever. Whether it's you know the NSA or consumer privacy or Facebook or yeah, uh, I'm Jack Banks, uh, I'm a student at the college. Uh, could you talk about the Prism program? Or yeah, sure. Or sure. Were you just talking about that? So, um, I mentioned um, part of the Prism program earlier. So, so basically, um, two programs came out with the with this NSA information, and one of them operated under. Um, section 702 of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, and that was known as PRISM. Um, the other one operated under Section 215 of the Patriot Act, um, and that's you know known as something else. There are a million names that are being thrown around. Um, but what PRISM was is it's basically a code name that says the government can use Section 702 orders to compel um, uh, companies from giving over uh, to get to compel companies to give over information, whether it's content or, or metadata. And um, this is something that uh, companies denied knowing about because they didn't know it as PRISM. They just knew it as complying with Section 702 orders. And the thing about these orders and the thing about related orders like national security letters, which are things that the FBI can just give out, for example, um, is that they often come with a gag. In fact, they always come with a gag. So you get this order that says, "Give, uh, you know, give us all this information," um, and uh, you're not allowed to talk about it. You're not allowed to tell people you gave them their information. You're not allowed to fight back in court. Really, I mean, you could try, and some companies have tried. Um, you're not allowed to to do a lot around this, and that's what makes this so so much of an issue. Is that this is secret law being interpreted? The other thing, Section 215 of the um, of the Patriot Act, which is known as the business records provision, um, basically says you, uh, um, as the government, could uh, collect all these business records from companies. And they've interpreted these business records to include metadata, which is who you call, when you call, you know, how often you call. And this is a bunch of information that can be pieced together to really paint an important picture about you. Um, there's this one project out of MIT. Um, I'm forgetting the name. I think it's called the Immersion Project, but I don't remember. And basically what it does is you, you sync it up with your Gmail account, and then it paints a picture. It connects a bunch of nodes um, around your email, who you've emailed, how often you email them, and it clusters people in terms of like, okay, you emailed this group, you emailed this group. And you get, begin to notice that just by knowing who you've emailed, when you've emailed, and how often, you can figure out you know, who your family is, what groups you associate with, um, you know, what groups other people associate with. And that is like very personal information that can come out just from this metadata, uh, which is why you know, we need 
to change these sorts of laws and really crack down on how the government uses this information. Does that answer your question? I can't hear you, unfortunately. There you go. Now you can. There you go. You're good. Thank you. Great. Great. Any other questions for Adi? Prism, uh, he also uh, works with patents. If you're curious about any of the things going on with patents. Yeah, go ahead. I got one. Hi, my name is Alec. I'm a student here also. Um, this is, might sound like a silly question, but uh, when I saw the movie Eagle Eye, that they kind of monitor the information like that. It, does taking the battery out of your cell phone prevent you from being monitored? Because you said the cell phone's a tracking device. Does that work, actually? Um, uh, yes. Um, to, be, to be perfectly honest, Yes. Um, if you take your battery out, there's no power going through your, your cell phone, and it, and it doesn't relay signals, nor does it store anything. Um, and I say yes very cautiously because I'm pretty sure that's true. And, and talking to security experts who both work here and abroad, this is something that um, is commonly done. Um, that, uh, uh, I mean, commonly in quotes, uh, that people who are very, uh, you know, uh, very, very, I don't want to use the paranoid, the word paranoid. Um, people who are very uh, aware of their privacy sometimes do take their batteries out of their cell phone. Um, the issue with taking your battery out of your cell phone is that it doesn't work. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, if you do want to be super secure, um, I would take your battery out of your cell phone if you're in a situation that, uh, you know, desperately requires it. But then your cell phone doesn't work. So there is a, a sort of trade off there. Not a silly Not a question. Silly question. I guess I have a part two to that. Are there any other ways besides that to protect yourself from being monitored? Sure. sure. Um, I think uh, one thing I could suggest is uh, there are certain programs for your cell phone, for both Android and iOS, um, that help encrypt your text messages and encrypt your calls. Now, this is something that um, more and more people are using, but it's still a small percentage because Encryption can be very difficult to implement, and it, and it can be kind of a nuisance. At the same time, this is a way of ensuring that the information that you send or the phone calls that you have is protected from anybody from listening in the middle. So there are apps like TechSecure or RedPhone that um, make sure that your texts and your phone calls are secure. And these are things that you can implement if you want to make sure you have a secure connection. Um, now, this won't protect your location information from being uh, um, relayed, but uh, there are certain technological um, fixes for privacy. Um, the same thing with your browsing habits. There are certain things that you can install, um, browser add-ons like Ghostery or Do Not Track Me or Disconnect Me, or a lot of them have a very similar name, that say, okay, you, we will block all these tracking cookies. We will block companies from monitoring what website you go to from one you know, one step to another. And um, uh, these work actually pretty well. Adi, would you be able to talk a little bit about Tor a little bit as well? Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. So um, Tor is a, um, uh, a technology that was built um, a number of years ago, um, and it, it stands for the Onion Router. Um, basically how it works is you... Um, log in to Tor, and all your traffic that goes inbound and outbound hops out between a number of different nodes and then exits somewhere else. So, um, you know, there are a number of people hosting Tor nodes, either relay nodes, which are the nodes in the middle, or exit nodes, which are the nodes that act like you. And um, what happens is all your information, all your... Um, uh, internet traffic is uh, is bounced around, so it can't be tracked back to where it comes from, and it's done in a way that involves you know certain levels of encryption that I, as not a computer science person, don't fully understand, but um, trust pretty much uh, you know uh, actually pretty strongly. Um, it's something that a lot of activists use around the world, and a lot of people who need to use this who are living in countries whether it's China or, or Syria or, um, uh, you know, a lot of them actually Middle Eastern countries that have uh, um, seen the government crack down as a result of things like the Arab Spring, um, uh, they rely on Tor in order to communicate freely. So it's a very important service um, that, uh, that a lot of people rely on. 
Um, it's actually fairly easy to use, too. You just go to, you know, um, you download the Tor bundle. I don't actually remember what the website is. Torproject.org, that's what it is. And uh, you download it, and that's, uh, that's how it works. Yeah, wasn't it uh, WikiLeaks has used that for all their leaks, correct? Yeah, yeah no, I never really have used that. Um, uh, whether it's WikiLeaks or journalistic organizations, there's a lot of um, you know up and coming journalistic organizations around the world that you know the only way they've been able to send around files and share information without being suppressed by the government is through things like Tor. So. It has literally saved lives and protected lives. Um, so it, I, I think it's a very important project that, that should be supported. Any other questions for Adi? Cool. Well, thank you very much, Adi. It was a pleasure to have you here to talk to us about this. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And if you guys have any more questions, um, go. I, I would suggest you go to our website, EFF.org. We um, you know, are always busy. We are always posting things about privacy, about the latest things around the NSA. Um, uh, like Adam mentioned, I also write about a number of other things, whether it's free speech online or copyright or patents or whatever. Um, if you have any sort of interest in getting involved, too, um, I would go to EFF.org slash NSA or go to the website um, stopwatching.us at stopwatching.us, and that's an easy way to sign on and to show your support that um, you know privacy really means a lot to me, and that uh, these sorts of programs should have some level of accountability. Um, Adam can also send around my contact information if you guys have any further questions, uh, and we're also actually getting more and more students involved. Um, so if you guys want to uh, do more things on campus. There's a lot of stuff that we do on campus, for example, around open access to scientific research or around free speech on campus. Um, if you guys want to get more involved, feel free to shoot me an email and I can get you connected. This is something we're going to be ramping up over the next few months um, and that people should get involved with. That's kind of how I got my start in this uh, and uh, you know, the rest is history. Cool. Well, thank you again, Adi. It was great speaking with you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you guys. Right, we'll be uh, having another lecture with Jeff Jarvis uh, at um, in early October, uh, so stay tuned to that. He's going to do the, the publicness of the web and the benefit of it. Today we talked about privacy. In October we're going to talk about the benefits of being public and how that can help uh, society move forward. Uh, so thank you again, everybody, for tuning in and coming and watching with us. And thank you, Adi and the EFF, and uh, have a good night. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you.